do a little bit of introduction about our speakers, um, our next speaker. So we have, you know, as we all know, fire smart landscaping has become a really large focus for both UCCE and Marin Master Gardeners. So last year, UC Cooperative Extension um, hired Sophia Porter, who you might have seen, um, to fill the role of fire smart landscaping science and education specialist to meet the growing need for disseminating information to the public about this important issue. And then fellow Marin Master Gardeners, Jim Casper, who's the class of 2010, and Bob Maselli, class of 2014, work closely with Sophia and others in the county to help educate residents about the importance of fire smart landscaping and creating defensible spaces around our homes. They've developed a really informative and helpful presentation, kind of scary <laughs> as we all think about how what we're going to do to our homes to be fire safe, but they're now going to share it with us. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about the two. So Bob has been a master gardener for almost 18 years, first in upstate Western New York, and now he's been here since 2014. He's QUEL certified, which QUEL, Q-W-E-L, stands for Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper, and also a UC certified climate steward. So with Jim Casper, Bob is an early member of the Fire Smart Landscape, the FSL team. Um, Bob is also co-founder of the Native Plants Guild and served as its co-chair for three years. He's also an active member of the help desk, so you might see him around, and the steering committee for that, and also really active on the garden walks team, and et cetera, et cetera. So what we hope is that these before and after examples will help you better understand and advise uh, Marin Master uh, 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 Gardener clients as to what problem situations they should look for in their gardens and then how to deal with them to reduce wildfire hazard risk without destroying their gardens or, or you know, uh, having to, um, uh, uh, you know, go into debt uh, to do this work. Um, we also hope that this presentation will help you understand better the importance of using native plants is to in restoring or enhancing um, ecological biodiversity in Marim home gardens and in the overall um, uh, environment in the natural environment. And that's really important um, because uh, it's basically the natural environment is um, uh, is sort of made up of our homes and our gardens and our properties. So uh, Jim presented, as he said, the theory of the case. So I'm going to focus mostly on the practice, mainly on the specific examples of fire smart implementation and the use of native plants. A, to help reduce wildfire threat risk, and B, to maintain environmental health and biodiversity in that fire smart landscape. So here are some key issues that we're trying to deal with. First, recommending ways to reduce home wildfire hazard risk while maintaining home landscapes that build and support a healthy, natural, ecological environment in Marin County. And then us master gardeners learning what we need to do to help homeowners understand how they might need to continually update their landscapes to keep up with the potential environmental changes of climate change. And what do we mean by that? Well. Steve covered some of what we mean by that. Namely, if we're going to plant a tree, we might want to plant a tree that would do well in Paso Robles or even in Santa Barbara, rather than a tree that we would normally plant, let's say, here in Marin. But we also mean some other things that are somewhat more troubling. Uh, so this presentation is not specifically about climate change, uh, but it is about the importance of landscapes in maintaining our natural ecology and environmental here in Marin. So 
helping homeowners to prepare and plan to adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change on our communities. That's part of what we should be doing. And that includes the hazard of major wildfires. And it requires a little bit of focus. So scientists agree that, that global warming may lead to extended abnormal cycles of extreme weather, like months or possibly years of abnormal rainfall, uh, possibly followed by or preceded by similar lengths of abnormally high temperatures and intense heat. And those in turn followed by or preceded by similar lengths of intense drought. In other words, what Jim calls whip, weather whiplash. Well, we've certainly had extraordinary rainfall and snowfall this winter. Um, about 57 inches of rain uh, up here on my hill in uh, North Nevada in the 60 plus days and 13 uh, atmospheric rivers of rain since December 1st, 2022. That's two years or more worth of rain in only four months. And more may be coming over the next year or more with the expected development of a strong El Nino this year. Uh, this recently extraordinarily wet weather has been preceded by extraordinary extreme higher temperatures and intense heat experienced in Europe and all other areas of the world, including in North America. And climatologists now think that before these two abnormal weather events, we may have been, or maybe still are, in a mega drought for more than 20 years, with dry periods perhaps not seen for 1,200 years, with a three-year drought in 2019 to 2020 that was the driest since 1896, and with the driest three-month period ever measured in California in January to March 2022. Again, weather whiplash? These developing threats might cause irreversible change and damage um, to our environment, our agricultural ability to grow food, and our lives and home environments. That sounds like a real downer, doesn't it? Well, again, we should understand that there are significant things that we can do now and recommend that we can recommend now that could provide help to correct this situation right now. We can use our home grounds to start reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our home landscapes, reducing or eliminating the fossil fuels and petroleum-based uh, garden materials we sometimes use, building soil that will sequester carbon, planting native plants and plant trees that will sequester garbon, and reducing erosion, filling, or other disturbance of soil that may release the carbon that's already sequestered there. Now, Barbara Robertson and Kathy Hunting, both master gardeners of long time, have prepared a two hour presentation that can provide you with more definitive and detailed information on much of this. The rest of my presentation, however, will concentrate on using defensible space to reduce wildflower risk and use native plants in so doing to make that defi defensible space better. So my first question to you is this, is this good fire smart landscape design, turning a landscape into a barren wasteland to fire smart a home? Well, that's how I found this place. And believe me, no, anything like this in the landscape is not a healthy or fire smart solution to reducing fire hazard risk. In fact, I believe that it could exacerbate the situation. And it's also unnecessary. You know, homeowners 
can have a healthy, beautiful, biodiverse, and sustainable fire, scot- fire smart landscape like this without denuding the garden. And that's the main thesis of my presentation. So let's see if I can prove it to you. And let's start by thinking about why and how to use California natives in this. Home landscapes and gardens are important elements of a healthy environment in in Marin County. And they're worth preserving uh, because they rebuild diversity, uh, biodiversity by protecting and extending Marin's unique family uh, plant communities um, by uh, encourage to encourage beneficial life, wildlife by creating habitat um, for other native plants and insects, birds, mammals, and other living creatures, including us, that preserve, protect natural environments by avoiding materials and practices that may harm them by building and protecting the life in their soil and by reducing use of water, energy, and other critical resources, and even to mitigate climate change, encouraging vital natural services that we don't often think about, but we can't do without. And they include clean air, sequestering carbon, building soil, minimizing or eliminating waste, purifying groundwater, and more. Creating or improving all of these in home landscapes is one role of native plants and a healthy fire smart garden. The design of the landscape and its defensible space using the fire smart guidelines that Jim has discussed reduces wildfire hazard risk. But the use of native plants enhances those natural environments. It makes them healthier, more sustainable, and more fire resilient. A healthy and fire safe residential landscape is the result of providing the best horticultural and gardening practices for the landscape. Choosing plants that are in sync with your local environment, placing them in the garden with adequate vertical and horizontal space, and giving them the right maintenance and care to keep them healthy and fire safe. Why? Well, because healthy plants are likely to be more fire resistant than plants um, struggling to survive. I think you've probably all seen that um, in uh, other gardens or maybe even parts of our own gardens. So using native plants is one important way to get more sustainable gardens. They make them better. They're more in tune with local plant environments. They support biodiversity and they lighten the ecological load on the environment. They use less water, chemicals, and are more in tune with our environments. And all of that produces a healthier home and communicating landscape that could be more, that can be more fire resilient. And why is that? Well, That's because native plants have grown up with everything else in Marin County. They're co-evolved with our Mediterranean climate, with our geography, with our topography, with our soil, animals, birds, insects, and even with us. Uh, It's their part, in fact, an integral part of California's true landscape. Native plants have been deeply associated with parts of long established local natural ecosystems for tens of thousands of years. So natives may just fit in and perform better than non-natives. They're better associated with an ecosystem's microclimate, soils, and mycorrhizal subterranean networks. And that close association may also be one reason that native plants normally stay hydrated longer on just average amounts of water from rain or irrigation. Another way that they can be not only healthier, but also more resilient to wildlife. 
Moreover, studies show that native wildlife visit and use native plants more frequently and longer than non-native plants. With some pollinator, butterfly, or bird species, this can be as much as five times more frequently or longer. That's why planting native plants may help decrease the serious decline in populations of these wildlife. So my little Rufus hummingbird visitor here knows this. He headed right for the hummingbird sage the morning he arrived. Finally, the deep root systems and canopies of native plants may also stabilize and preserve soils uh, on, on slopes that by reducing erosion. And that's important because in hilly Marin, Marin County, erosion can often be a landscape and soil quality problem. But the native plant root systems may hold a hill better and more sustainably than any Thing else. This hill is more than 30 feet from my home. Uh, it's very steep and it was planted using native plants with vigorous root systems like Ceanothus, Manzanita, California Fermentia, California buckwheat, dwarf triode bush, and sage to reduce erosion on steep slopes. It worked. Um, uh, we had very little erosion and the 13 ARs we put up with uh, so far this year. But note how the plants or plant groupings are spaced for fuel separation. And this is not just functional. This house, this hill is also beautiful when it's in bloom from early spring through fall. And it's a great habitat for beneficial insects, for pollinators and for birds. So I'm gonna start by looking at a few specific examples of how homeowners might build defensible space to reduce the wildfire hazard risk without destroying their landscapes. I'll also show some examples of using native plants to build and maintain that sustainable earth-friendly garden. And, but I'll repeat that one overarching um, principle in defensible space is to work from the home out to design um, our garden to reduce wildfire risk and fuel loads by doing our landscape and not worrying as much about the plants that we that we have or choose. So start by working from the house out, placing the plants appropriately, and use materials that are given uh, in terms of their relationship to the home and other plantings. Fuel separation is the primary aim, and fuel reduction, it goes right along with that. And as Jim has pointed out, consistent plant and garden maintenance and appropriate irrigation are critical to maintaining those goals. So let's start from zone zero or zero to five feet from the home. Uh, here's what we need to do to protect against ember fall in this area. No flammable mulch, fencing, fencing, furniture, or anything that'll burn in this area. No dead branches or other garden litter. No roof litter. No tall plants under the eaves. Nothing flammable or attached to the house or close to the house. And no branches within 10 um, feet of the room or the chimney. So here are some examples now of what a homeowner might look for and what they might actually do, because it's what I looked for after uh, having learned a lot about this uh, from uh, my work with Fire Smart Landscaping, but also from two inspections from the Nevada Fire uh, 
department. So if there are foundation plants or other combustibles touching or close to the house uh, or in front of windows or eaves or overhang or that are more than 12 to 18 inches tall or that are twiggy or easily to a nice by embers, then like these, then they should be removed. As Jim has said, replaced with materials that are safe to use within five feet of the home. So non-combustibles like rocks, gravel, pebbles, pavers, and so on can be used. And if plants are used, they should not touch the house. In fact, they shouldn't even be really near the house. And they should be low growing, non-woody, appropriately irrigated perennials or annuals or succulents. And even here, you can consider using California natives. Now here, the beds in front were not wide enough to prevent new plants from touching the house and irrigation was difficult to bring in. So pebbles alone replaced the problematic plants. Uh, actually, uh, the pebbles uh, are about the same color match to the house color and they look pretty good. So we were lucky there that we found something that worked. Um, the same situation existed along the side of the house here so the roses and fine leaf plants against the house were removed and replaced by pebbles. And here, the decomposed granite um, path and the pebbles provide a ground clearance of eight to 10 feet between my home and the garden over here. So, now to think about plants to replace any that might need to be removed and why you might consider native plants for this or any other area in the defensible space. So let's take a look. So you want healthy plants. You want water-wise plants. You want pollinator-friendly plants. You want plants that'll help build habitats. You want plants that are well-behaved. That means they're non-invasive. It also means that they have few dry or twiggy branches and they shed little debris and that they are low care and easily maintainable. So that's a good list for plants in a fire smart or frankly in any, any earth uh, friendly garden. And as native plants check most of these boxes, native plants might be among some of the homeowner's best choices. So the tall rosemary and um, lavender plants that were planted right along here, touching the house, they were removed. And as shown in the picture here, they were replaced with a two to three foot uh, bed of non-combustible pebbles close to the house, with the borders beyond that planted in low growing native coral belts, low growing native sage hybrids, catmint, herbs, and strawberry plants. Looks beautiful in the spring and early summer. Um, this is how it looked uh, last year, and it's beginning to start come right now. Um, and when the flowering is done, it's cut back to a smart, a fire smart, two to four inches, as shown here. A lot of homeowners are concerned that leaving zone zero barren after removing problematic plants might ruin the beauty and also the value of their homes. Um, but as you've seen from the previous side, um, by choosing the right plants, 
for the right places and giving them the right care, there may be useful and lovely solutions to their concern. But remember, no plant should touch the house or be too close to it. There should always be a non-combustible space between plants and the home. So in addition to the low growing coral bell and sage shown in the previous example, there are lots of other choices of native plants that might prevent or replace uh, problematic plants in this the critical zone. So how about native wildflowers to start with? Uh, here we have Clarkia, farewell to spring. There's cream cuffs, there's California bells, and here are five spot, uh, all beautiful plants. And uh, this uh, California um, ringlet butterfly uh, seems to like them too. Um, and these are only a few of the annual uh, wildflowers, native annual wildflowers that might fill the bill here. Um, or these low growing native herbaceous perennials might also work well in this in this area close to the house. Um, here are uh, blue-eyed grass. Here's beech strawberry. We use that. Uh, here's margarita um, penstemon. And this is coast buckwheat. Again, other low-growing species or cultivars of these genera might also work well, as would many other native plants uh, herbaceous plants, uh, less than 12 to 8 inches uh, tall wood. Or you mentioned um, succulents. Well, how about native succulents? Here are low-growing native succulents, um, such as um, Catalina Island, Dudlia, Bitterroot, or uh, uh, Coast Dudlia, Bitterroot, Lewisia, um, or cliff maids or Siskiyou Lewisia. These have beautiful flowers when they're in spring, and they don't, none of them grow more than about six inches tall. So those are things that people can do and do easily. Um, uh, they're, they're not expensive to do, um, and they're easy even for a homeowner to do, or certainly if they can, their gardening, usual gardening supply uh, people, service supply people can do it. So th if we think about that, now let's think about beyond zone zero, zones one and two, uh, beyond five feet. Um, and we'll see that many things can happen that can't happen close to the home. So at 30 feet, as Jim has said, things are less likely to ignite a home. So we'll be looking at examples of things like close to the house, lower, appropriately irrigated plants, moving away from the house, larger shrubs and trees, and we can even use wood mulch, uh, vertical and horizontal space, between shrubs and trees, especially on clopes, needs to be maintained. Hardscape fuel grapes breaks need to be used where that's possible. Uh, on some steep slopes, that's difficult to do. And all plants need to be accessible for cleanup and maintenance and irrigation. And because we're now moving out from the house substantially, um, we may have to work with neighbors to get a good, appropriate, defensible space for both. You may have uh, a large area uh, in a, a, a place of uh, grass and weeds, uh, annual grass and weeds. This is mine. Um, and these are about three to four feet tall here. Um, and it grows every year, and so we mill, mow it every year. 
and we mow it down usually in April and again in either late May or mid-June. And we do that every year. We cut it back to about two inches tall and we keep it cut back during fire season. The before picture here shows a, an acacia hedge. It's about 40 feet long and here about seven feet tall. It backs up to uh, a bunch of uh, catoni aster that are invasive uh, and that are growing under low growing coast live oaks on a steep hill. This um, uh, it provides a serious fire ladder that needed work. It's a serious fire ladder because the uphill leads directly to the front of my home. So we removed the acacia and the cotone aster, um, and we uh, limbed up the oaks to about 10 to 12 feet to remove the fire ladder and also to allow clear entry of firefighting equipment if it came to that. Uh, but it looks a little barren, doesn't it? Well, surprise. In the spring of 2019, a few small Arroyo Lupin and uh, California poppy plants volunteered in this cleared space. Uh, those seeds, Lord knows how long they were living there uh, under the acacia. Um, they went to seed, we added some more seed, and in the spring of 2020, there were 40 feet of a royal lupin, California poppies, and even some clarkia. They started blooming in early February, they continued until May, and then, since they're annuals, they were cut down for seed for the following year. That's truly fire smart. It's also a great use of native plants. Um, uh, even my neighbors come and co comment on it. Good comments. So even after removing the occasion Katoni Esther, my neighbor's large Mayaporum hedge was still overgrown into my yard and close to my house. It's infested by Mayaporum thrips. So there's significant dead or dying wood in it, as you can see in this picture. So I had it trimmed on the property line from my side of the fence. And here's what it looks like now, clear to more than 10 feet from the side of my house. That's safer, much safer. Uh, this is in zone one and two. Um, I've got uh, 10 deciduous valley oaks that live on my property, um, or I live on their property. Um, and their branches were growing almost to the ground. Actually, here, they were on the ground. Um, again, a potential fire ladder. So here, it looks as if trees and plants were removed. But all really that was done was to limb the trees up to about 10 to 15 feet. That opened up space below them, and that allowed me to plant some interesting plants that are na native and grow under oaks. Um, and uh, it also allows the lights on these trees to be much more dramatic at night than they were before the limbing up was done. Under oak trees further out in zone two, we had planted leptospermum uh, to uh, provide erosion control on a steep uh, cordon of the uh, course of the garden. That was a bad choice. It was a wrong plant in the wrong place. They became overgrown and twiggy. They were in an area that was difficult to maintain them, especially to prune out dead wood. And with their needle-like foliage, it all added up to a serious potential fire hazard. Uh, they're gone now. We put wattles on the hill for now to hold it. And we are, we're actually in the process of planting right now 
low growing and low maintenance Anchor Bay Cyanothus and low growing Catalina perfume ribes to replace it. Uh, here we have a Budlia and a Salvia, a Santa Rosa Salvia, both useful pollinator plants, but both had become seriously overgrown and tall and twiggy. And as they're under, uh, partially under uh, valley oaks, they could have become a fire ladder hazard too. They've now been reduced in height um, and width to provide better vertical and horizontal separation, and the dead wood has been removed. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that in all of these cases, we didn't, we didn't denude any gardens. We opened things up, we pruned them to decrease to, um, uh, to a decrease density and to increase horizontal space and reduce wildflower spread. And continuing work and maintenance on these areas continues to maintain that kind of separation to make sure that we can slow potential fire spread if it happens, even though these particular areas are more than 60 feet from my home. It's even better in Jim's garden. He's got good plant separation and even better uses non-combustible stone and rock on the areas between the plants and on paths and patio areas to provide fire breaks that will minimize or eliminate wildflower, wildflower runs and ember flare-ups in the garden. So we've got essentially good hardscape separation between the garden and my home. And we've got fire breaks on the hill using hard, hardscape covered stairs and paths and walls and a patio. But the use of the hardscape in the garden itself uh, could be a whole lot better. I'm still trying to find a way to keep um, the roll, the pebbles or uh, gravel to keep from washing down the hill uh, in heavy rain forms. Because this hill is state, steep, in some areas more than 100% grade or 45 degree. Uh, uh, uh. So remember, we're trying to achieve horizontal and vertical space to uh, increase uh, fuel separation and reduce fuel mass. And what this and the foregoing examples show is that this wildfire hardening of the landscape can be done without leaving large barren spaces or denuding the garden. Uh, often that can be achieved by the desired results by simply reducing plant bulk and height or removing some branches or replacing some plants with beautiful natives. So here's an example of what I think is good fire smart design. We've got on the hill above, there are trees and shrubs spaced on that slope to prevent erosion. The non-combustible retaining wall that runs across uh, is a good fire break between the planting island, the rest of the landscape, and the home, uh, as are the patio and paths along the front. And the mostly native or Mediterranean climate plants provide, in a relatively small space, um, a drought-tolerant, pollinator-friendly, earth-friendly habitat corridor garden. I also talk about using habitat corridor gardens to increase biodiversity and help wildfire, wildlife move from open space to open space. This um, habitat corridor garden uses lower growing native plants like these. We've got lilac verbena, We've got the aptly named 
hummingbird sage. We've got uh, red California buckwheat. Here is sage, it's bis bees bliss sage, a beautiful uh, ground cover that blooms in late spring and early summer. And here's a sage, uh, low sage um, uh, shrub called uh, sage pozo, pozo blue. <clears throat> Here's the more relatively lower growing plants for use closer to the home. This is emerald carpet manzanita. This is uh, uh, Everett's Choice California fuchsia. This is uh, Baja pitcher sage. Here we've got more sage. This is point sal spreader. Uh, it's a larger, taller um, uh, ground cover. And here are some beautiful uh, chaparral clematis. Uh, all of these suitable close to the house within 30 feet. Some larger shrubs and small trees for the border between zones one and two. These are pollinator and bird friendly. Um, this is Western redbud which is in, uh, in bloom right now in the garden. Um, this is a large manzanita. It's Monica manzanita, but other manzanitas that are large would do well in this area. And here's a beautiful Ray Hartman Ceanothus in full bloom. It is in full bloom right now in the garden, uh, but other Ceanothus that are large would work well as easily in this area and give you the same beauty. Um, some shrubs that can get potentially big include spring showers, uh, California currant. This is sugar bush. Here we have summer holly. This is really big. It's about 20 to 25 feet tall. And here we have Pacific wax myrtle. Many of these large shrubs also can provide great privacy uh, shields uh, where needed. And here we have more large ground covers and shrubs. Uh, this is a uh, Ceanothus, Caramel Ceanothus and its cultivar cultivars like Yankee Point. Um, here we have uh, Santa Maria um, uh, sage or Santa Rosa sage in full bloom. And here we have Catalina perf perfume in full bloom as well. Um, and then finally, some other larger natives that would be placed farther away from home include Lewis Edmonds Manzanita. Uh, we've got Toyon here. Um, you know, all know about Toyon has the beautiful red Christmas berries which my wife would love to use to decorate the house. But unfortunately, the robins and cedar waxwings get to them before, and we've never been able to use them. Here we have Ken Taylor uh, from Antia. Um, it's about five feet tall by about 12 feet wide. Um, and it's probably about as big as it's going to grow. There are much larger uh, for Monty is if you want to cover more territory. And finally, we have some blue jeans, Ceanothus, so-called because they look exactly like in color a washed blue jeans. So up to now, we've been talking about fire smarting defensible landscape. And I hope that we've shown you that you can do that, uh, reduce the fire, hazard risk to the home and keep the garden in great shape. But what about the home itself? Well, as master gardeners, we're not really trained to give homeowners advice on home hardening, um, unless we happen to be a builder or a firefighter. So if you get a client who needs this kind of advice, this is where you should send them. Fire Smart Marin has a really great uh, place on their URL about home hardening that will give them some really good information to start. Uh, but to give you some idea as to what might be done, 
let's consider some work that we've completed on my home. So my home is a class A roof, which is fire resistant. It's got metal uh, gutters and downspouts. Um, uh, it's got double pane, but not thermal pane windows on all floors. Um, and it's got an internal sprinkler system. But our wooden shingles and trim, and the, that's what's on here, right? Uh, and foundation, soffit, and cable, gable vents were not fire resistant. The first thing we did while we were hardening the house was not this yet, was to install these um, Vulcan foundation vents to start hardening our home. They're fire resistant um, and will close in the in the uh, with if fire starts in the area. But wildfire may not be the only threat to your home. These neighbors can do some serious damage, including, surprisingly, making your home more vulnerable to amber storm incursion. So, so how, you ask? Well, I asked it too. Uh, here's how. Our feathered friends drilled hundreds of holes on two sides of the house and filled them with acorns. That's their new granary. But these holes could also admit embers into the interior space between the interior walls and the wood siding, possibly taking the house. So we wanted to make our house not just fire resistant, but acorn woodpecker resistant. So the first, you have to bring your code up to your home up to code. Um, and this mean, meant that we had to install plywood sheathing where there was none. And then we installed hardy board fiber cement uh, resistant, fire resistant siding, a trim, and soffit enclosures and Vulcan fire-resistant foundation, soffit, and gable vents. Um, this is now reasonably fire-resistant. Um, and thank the good Lord, we haven't had a fire. Now, I can't report on how fire-resistant that might be. But after about 15 months, I can report that there's not been one bloody acorn woodpecker hole real in the siding. Victory. So to recap, native plant fire smart landscapes. Appropriately native plants used can produce defensible space that will help reducing fire smart risk. They can also produce defensible space that is a more friendly or environment, nurturing soil, encouraging biodiversity, mitigating climate change, encouraging wildlife, and pre preventing erosion. But like all plants in the defensible space, Native plants need to be appropriately spaced for separation and appropriately maintained and irrigated. And so think about what you might want to look for in native plants. So in zone zero, low growing, ignition resistant, herbaceous annuals and perennials or succulents, nothing touching the house. And of course, these are California natives. In zone one, 50 to 30 feet from the house, smaller shrubs and trees, good vertical and horizontal separation, non-combustible fire grate breaks between plant clusters. And finally, 30 or more feet from the house, larger trees and shrubs, 
and wood mulch. Now you'll see in the background here, some large trees. I back up to the Rush Creek open space preserve and we can't touch them. Um, uh, but we can talk to the people who run the open space if there are problems that their trees are causing in terms of fire risk to our area. And they will actually do some pretty good work for us. So here's something that you can use to uh, provide as a digital handout to pass on to clients. We can, these are some resources to help choose appropriate native plants for specific home sites and specific applications, as well as getting information or help on planting and caring for native plants. And with that, thanks for listening. Are there questions? Wow, I love seeing all the pictures of the plants. I mean, like you said, you can make it so that it is beautiful. So um, thank you for, I, I think it's also helpful for us to sort of see, you know, a practical application of it, you know, for both what you and Jim have been doing in your separate houses. So thank you for that. Um, I see one question in the chat from a little bit a while ago, and then I'm sure others will come up with more questions. But Beth Parker was saying, can you just leave soil next to the home or do you need non-combustible material like pebbles? Um, I, I, I have some areas um, that where I have nothing planted and there is soil there. Um, that's the easy way to do it. On the other hand, it has to be weeded um, and be, because it has to be weeded. It's open soil. And so uh, I'm thinking that maybe I will, in fact, get some more of those pebbles and put them in that place. Okay. Um, let me, this is Jim. Let me add a, uh, one other thing. Um, I don't know what the sequence was in terms of covering bees. But a lot of native bees do require uh, exposed soil because uh, they are solitary bees, uh, either soil or in in uh, wood. Um, so there are actually some places where you'll see recommendations to have exposed soil. And as Bob said, next to the house is perfectly fine. And on that point, um, we'll have um, James Campbell talk to us about bees in class 15. So we're currently on class 14. So two weeks from now, we'll hear from him. So good point. I have a question. It was kind of long to type it in. So I hope it's okay if I just ask it. And it's probably more for Jim. Um, everybody in our neighborhood is uh, working on making their um, landscaping fire safe. We're up on a hill or round open space, except for one neighbor. And they have a really tall evergreen right up next to their house and they're down from like two or three houses down from me. And that's the way the wind blows. Is there, do you have any suggestions on what to do? Um, I, I'm glad to hear there's a law coming in 2025, but any suggestions we could contact the local fire department or. So let me ask you a question first. So, so approximately where do you live? I'm in the Dominican area on Dominican okay. Drive, and we end in a cul-de-sac, which also so, leads So uh, I live in Tam Valley, oh. not too far from Mill Valley. So the scenario you're describing is very much what you would see in downtown Mill Valley. The reality is large trees properly trimmed, given the guidance that both Bob and I mentioned, are not going to be a problem from a fire point of view. Um you know, if they're, if it's a, you know, which you've, you've probably seen problems reported about fallen trees, various problems, especially with the winds recently. Uh, I would bet that a lot of cases it's because there are problems with that individual tree. It's been weakened maybe because of the drought. Uh, I've heard of a lot of uh, Monterey pines, uh, which have a relatively short lifespan, about 70 years. Um, Stephen Swain mentioned select tree. You can get information about tree lifespan there. Um, I'd say if the tree is properly maintained and kept away from the, that neighbor's structures, as well as 
any of that person's neighboring structures, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you can contact the fire agency. Dominican Black Canyon is uh, San Rafael. I know all of the fire agencies are doing defensible space inspections and they would that inspection would come up with a list of suggestions. So that yeah. would be one approach if you wanted to go that, that route. Yeah, they're not pruning it. It's right up next to the house. It's, uh, yeah, so uh, I can do that. That's fine. Or there's a group of us that would actually like to see it trimmed, but they're not willing to do that or pruned. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and, and just, again, in Mill Valley, you've got, Redwoods basically almost right next to the house, even within the, the, the zero to five feet. And there, nobody's requesting any of those to be adjusted in any significant way. Nora? Yeah, I, I, the, I, I live in the Dominican area also, actually. It's called Country Club. It's closer to uh, Montecito. And the fire department came and did an inspection and left me a report or how to get to the report. I have a Tibichina hedge, which is right up against the house, and it grows tall and gets under the eaves. They said nothing about removing it. And I'm listening to both of you and thinking I might have to let it go. Um, but I was surprised that they didn't, that there was no comment about it. it, it it's, it's so much dependent on the individual. Um, uh, but I would say, so you, it's, a, it's a princess tree, right? Yeah, Princess it's a flower. whole. It's a whole but, head. It's been there for twenty five years. It's yeah. I, it's if if, it, if it's, I would say if it's growing well, and if it's the biggest concern, I think I'd have is if it's near a window. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in that case, you might want to actually have the tree removed or well trimmed back. Um, I'm going to go out on the limb a little bit and say, uh, even under the eaves, if you trim it down, uh, yeah. that should be uh, appropriate. But uh, I. Go by their guidelines, uh, you know, because they're the ones that, that they're the ones that are going to enforce this, not us as master gardeners. Yeah, no, they said nothing about that. I, but I one other question: they did comment about a fence that has a four by four, or yeah, four by four up that's attached to the house. And is there a non-combustible something I can use to attach the fence so so that? Um, it doesn't have wood right against the house. Right. I I can't think of anything given those dimensions. I mean, the like hardy board is like uh, paneling. Yeah. Uh, one approach would be to wrap that particular piece of wood with something like hardy board, something that's not flammable. Mm -hmm. Okay. That uh, that's that's what they did in, in hardening the house. Um, they they couldn't replace some of the fascia uh, uh, below the roof. And so what they did was exactly what Jim said. Uh, the contractor um, put hardy board on all sides of the fascia um, to uh, make it uh, you know, relatively fire resistant. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. Carol, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the questions. Yes. Okay. So I'm going back through. Um, so Beth said she made a comment. She said the, she loved the mention of Toyon with cedar wax wings. My home office window looks out on a large Toyon and it's full of cedar wax wings right now. So nice little commentary. Um, Elizabeth was saying these recommended fire resistant hardening changes all seem extremely expensive expensive to implement. There's no way to make these kinds of changes without having a lot of money. How can a middle income household pay for this? Are there grants, subsidies, or other types of funding available to support these kinds of changes? Um, that I, let me try that one. Uh, if, if you live in Nevada or other fire is, districts, they do, they do uh, give grants. Uh, you have to get inspected. Um, the inspector will usually uh, send you a written report of what he or she found um, that needed work. Um, and uh, they will also tell you what kind of grants are available. Uh, so, and uh, in Novato specifically, that applies not just to defensible space landscape, but it also uh, uh, applies 
to home hardening. Uh, and uh, I know that there are other uh, districts that uh, do that too. Um, you know, you should call the, uh, the, the, the fire agency in the area with you are and, and, ex and explore that with them. So let, let me take it a step further. Um, three years ago in March of 2020, there was a, in a, a, a ballot proposition called that basically was approved by um, most of the sections in Marin County. I, it's everybody but those areas covered by the Belvedere and the Tiburon Fire Agencies uh, to create what's called the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, MWPA. The MWPA funds grants like Bob described, again, both for defensible space and home hardening. The requirement, and this is where all the fire agencies are doing the inspections, is you have to have an inspection. And the work you do that would qualify for grant uh, support is work identified in that inspection. Um, keep in mind that that's an annual grant program. So if you got the inspection done today, for example, and you had some work to do, you could apply for grant funding um, and do some work between now and June 30th. And then you could do more work starting July 1 because that's the next fiscal year and reapply at that point in time. Um, they're not significant. We're not talking, you know, thousands of dollars at one time. Uh, but again, you can do things on a on a on a step by step basis and take care of things over time and get some grant funding for that, both on a home hardening and defensible space point of view. The other thing that I would recommend is, um, you know, as Jim said, you don't have to do this all at once. Um, so by working over time, um, you can spread out the costs of uh, whatever you need to do uh, over time. Um, and uh, that way you can budget for it, you can plan for it. If you need to get a small loan to back it up, you can do that. Um, and, uh, but, but, but begin at least, um, you know, walk around, decide what you need to do, work out, a reasonable plan over the time to do it um, and then figure out how to pay for that piece by piece by piece. And I think too, you know, I think the, the fire marshals, of course, it depends on where you're located, but I think they give you a list of, of items and, and if they see that you're trying to sort of, you know, pick away at it. So, okay, you know, leaf litter. So you're cleaning, you know, you're cleaning out your gutters, you're cleaning out the leaves underneath your deck that have accumulated there. You're sort of dealing with dead, um, you know, fallen branches and, 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 um, and grasses above the property. So if you can make a good, you know, you, you work hard on sort of, you know, checking, checking items off the checklist, then they see that you're trying to do what you can. And so they're supportive. And then they can, they also then can make suggestions about possible um, grant cycles and things too. So I don't see any other questions. Does anybody else want to make a comment or? It, it, uh, Carol, there was one question about our native plants easy to grow from cuttings. Of course. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Um, so the short answer is it depends. Um, I know there are, uh, I'm sure there are tips and tips and hints that you could find online. I also know that there is an individual who uh, used to be a master gardener, has a separate business um, uh, in Nevada, I believe. And she encourages uh, people learning how to propagate plants and her focus is on natives. So it's very possible um, from cuttings and from other methods. And we did have, we had a session on um, propagation that delved into some of the natives too. So if we go back and I think there was some, there was a resource list that had a few company names where we could mostly natives and, you know, various places where you can go 
buy and then also get information from them about um, growing from cuttings. Well, I think we, we, this is wonderful as always. I mean, this is the second time that I've gone through this because I was, of course, a class of 2022. So I got to hear your, your dual presentation last year, but always timely, always important to be able to hear it. And so thank you very much for taking the time. And you all, they provide us with some great handouts. So um, along with their presentation. So those will go up on the CT site tonight. So thank you.